Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. Um, and we talked a little bit about this the last time that Emily Jashinsky was on. Um, Emily is a editor, the culture editor over at The Federalist. She's also involved in Young America's Foundation, where she trains up the next generation of uh, sort of right of center journalists um, and sends them out like her little minions to all these different <laughs> outlets. Uh, after they learned what they needed to learn from Emily Jashinsky. Um, but we talked a little bit about this last time she was on, but we're going to have this regular segment here on High Noon. We're calling it After Dark. Um, just a little play on on the time of the day and also the fact that a lot of these are going to involve cocktails. All of them. Um, all of them. So Inez is drinking a what? Um, well, I made myself something called a Boulevardier. I may be completely mispronouncing that, but it is Campari and whiskey, basically, and a little bit of vermouth. Here you see the differences between Inez and I crystallized perfectly. Inez made something with Campari and vermouth, and I had one mini bottle of Captain Morgan somewhere in my cupboard that I poured with the lime seltzer in my fridge, and it's not great. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, so <laughs> I think that's just a function of you calling me old and decrepit. Like I, uh, in the last time we did this, you're like, oh, I am a young, adorable whippersnapper. I'm a young conservative <laughs> and you're, you're an elder millennial. So yeah, that's the advantage of being old. You, you have an actual bar cart with vermouth on it. Um, no, but we are going to be doing uh, the segment once a month, usually at the end of the month, the last Wednesday of the month, as we are doing it now, this will be released the last uh, Wednesday, right before Thanksgiving. Um, and we're going to be doing this, I think, because the you know the news cycle moves so quickly, um, and oftentimes you miss something. So we'll be talking about big stories from the month past, and also kind of updating you on on our um, what we're seeing, um, Emily and I, in terms of where all of these forces in in the country are going. Um, whether I think we're going to have a little bit more of an optimistic take today. I think right now um, we feel pretty optimistic. Last month, I think we were a little more pessimistic. Um, so it, it should be interesting to to look back and see um, over the past month how our predictions for the future of the left and right in America, and more importantly of the country itself. Um, are, are really going. But um, I want to open this up with the the obvious um, thing that just broke. We're actually recording this on Friday evening. Um, and the thing that just broke a couple hours ago is is the verdict in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, right? Um, so, so Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty on, on all these counts, um, all the counts that were arrayed against him. The judge had actually dropped one um, gun charge that was based on a law that uh, he found ridiculously vague. There were a series of exceptions. It was, and anyway, the, the judge basically said this, this law is ridiculously vague. It, it doesn't actually make any sense. Um, and he actually dropped that charge. Uh, but the other five charges all related to Kyle's actions that night in Kenosha during the riots, including um, killing in self-defense. I think we can now say that. Uh, killing in self-defense uh, two uh, of the rioters and uh, wounding a third by shooting him in the arm. So, um, Emily, what, were you surprised when you when you got this this verdict? Actually, I wasn't surprised at all, and I know that there were some on the right who were surprised, um, but I, I had pretty, and then as you've said this over and over again, th this was fairly clear cut. And I still sort of, it, maybe I just still sort of have trust in the the average American um, that they can look at something like this and not be cowed um, into doing what's wrong and not be sort of intimidated and dominated by the the white supremacy narrative or whatever it is, um, the, the race narrative into doing something that's wrong. I, I just think the facts in this case were really strong. And I wasn't glued to my screen over the course of the trial, but I do really think the prosecution did a terrible job. They looked like they were grasping at straws. They looked like they were flailing. Uh, the defense seemed so much more prepared. So the evidence was already, I think, more clearly on one side or the other. But when you layer just a poor poor theatrics um, and a poor performance from the prosecution on top of the existing sort of factual burden, I just, I wasn't really surprised at all. Yeah, and poor trigger discipline on the part of the prosecutor pointing <laughs> gun at the jury and the courtroom. So <laughs> um, bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are kind of two two strains, as you said, of people who were, um, for, for whom this verdict is unexpected, right? Um, one is, and I, I kind of want to take each one of these in turn, one is, uh, folks in in the left or maybe even the center who just watch the mainstream or the corporate media 
Um, and as you say, they really did not, they wildly mischaracterized what was going on in the courtroom. I mean, one particular incident that, that really shocked me was to see actually a local Fox affiliate. Um, <clears throat> the, the day that uh, the, the guy who survived getting shot uh, by Kyle Rittenhouse took the stand, he, he basically blew up the prosecution's case, right? He's, he was a witness for the prosecution, but he basically blew up the, the, um, the prosecutor's case by saying, in fact, yes, he had had his hands up um, with his weapon, but that he had lowered it and point, lower, lowered his hands and pointed his weapon at Kyle, and that's when Kyle shot him. Um, gross crits. That would be Gage gross crits. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, and the way that that was covered in local media was you know, victim takes stand, testifies that his hands were up. That, <laughs> that's beyond sort of um, bias. That's that's actively misleading about what the guy actually testified to. Um, and so folks who are watching that coverage, absolutely. I can see how they would be shocked and angered by by this verdict. Um, you even had, do you remember the, the who was, I think it was somebody from the Young Turks, Um who said like, like she didn't know that the victims in this case were white? Yeah, yeah. I, I saw several people say that. Um, and if you look at the news coverage, including coverage from this week, um, you can see the AP, for example, identifying Rittenhouse as white and then not racially identifying his victims, or I shouldn't say his victims, but uh, the men he killed. It, it, and you, that seems like a simple thing. It maybe seems anodyne. But when you think about the narrative that that puts in someone's mind, that he's at, and I continued to hear this in the coverage, that he was at protests, that he was at Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, well, first of all, he was at a riot. And secondly, if you're making it salient that he was at a BLM event, um, then you should probably say what race everybody was involved in. Otherwise, it is if you're going to name his race, you're set making it sound like he went and slaughtered a bunch of um, innocent black protesters. Yeah, I mean, it, the the level of misleading coverage was insane. And actually, I think Barry Weiss had um, a, a great piece that I haven't, I only skimmed because she, she just published it right before we, <laughs> um, right before we came on. But uh, about how, you know, this should be a wake up call for people. It, it, if this verdict surprises you in that way, from that direction, then you really need to look at what media you're consuming, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, they they have misled you and in a very factually checkable way, right? Um, in a way where if you actually went and listened to the testimony, you would see that what they were writing about it was not just a perspective it or or biased. It's, it's actively wrong and, and misleading you about what happened in in that courtroom. Um, and I think that's that's totally true in one part of this. Um, the other set of folks who are surprised by this are people uh, on the sort of black pilled right, right? Because um, mm -hmm. they believed that the court system was so utterly corrupt, um, that the, our institutions are so corrupt, uh, that we could not deliver a just verdict, uh, that the jurors would be intimidated by, for example, um, the threat of having their names released, uh, the threat of which, Maybe you could talk a little bit about MSNBC getting in trouble here, but um, the, the, that the politics surrounding the case and the media coverage surrounding the case uh, would make it impossible for jurors to do their job in an impartial way and actually take into account only the evidence that was presented in the courtroom. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, does this does this make you more white pilled about about America's future or institutions? Um, and and sort of what would be your response to somebody who is perhaps pleasantly surprised by this verdict, but ne nonetheless is very surprised? I think it is surprising when America's institutions meet their expectations now because we are drowning in institutional failure. That said, I also think that institutional failure is often uh, from the top down. And this is a case where the power was in the hands of average people, people who had the, the misfortune of being selected for jury duty uh, down in Kenosha, which, by the way, is about an hour uh, from where I grew up. And that's a, I mean, that's a really interesting contrast to most of the institutional failure that we see now, which is coming from powerful journalists, uh, powerful lawmakers, um, 
in, in this case, this was power in the hands of, of you know, ordinary civilians. Um, and I guess we should, I, I think it's unwise for us to underestimate the extent to which the sort of woke conditioning does dominate the minds of people in Generation Z and, and millennials like both of us. Um, but at the same time, you know, facts, when they're laid out in front of people, they should still stand, you know, there are always outliers, but this case is, it, it, to your point, it was pretty clear cut. Uh, the, the facts were clearly in one direction. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe that is a white pill, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I guess the, the, the pessimistic way of looking at it is that um, the standard is now incredibly clear. Uh, so if, if you are um, fortunate, for example, it's easy for, to imagine this trial going the other way if there hadn't been actual live footage streamed of a lot of these incidences. I mean, how rarely um, in these kinds of uh, altercations do you get actual footage of what happened? Um, not every single thing that happened that had a video to go with it, but a lot of it did. Right. In this case, which allowed the New York Times of all places to do this uh, sort of minute by minute breakdown about where Kyle was, where um, the, the people attacking him were, you know, he, you know, piecing footage together, piecing together um, sort of reports from different literally block by block um, in, in, in this altercation. And I should say this conflagration going on um, in Kenosha. And, um, you know, I, I guess the, the pessimistic way of, of thinking about this would be, I mean, imagine how this trial might have gone if not for that documentation. Well, and this is where we see the double-edged sword of new media <clears throat> in that it is actually documented that the reporter for the New York Times left that night where uh, the, the Rittenhouse incidents happened. It is documented that the New York Times reporter left uh, because it was going to get dangerous. Fair enough, uh, but you have to have you know the eyes of the the defenders of our democracy on the ground. Um, that's the sort of public's window into these things as they happen. And there were journalists from the Daily Caller and Town Hall um, and the Blaze who stayed there and got a wealth of the footage that we rely on to understand what happened that night. And on the other hand, though, would any of this have happened? If the the mindless blue checks hadn't spent the summer ver signaling their virtue on Twitter in a way that fanned the flames of riots, I don't think that it would have. I mean, I think the the group think that it's, is incentivized um, on the sort of gamifica gamification of our public discourse that is Twitter. Um, I think the level of group think and virtue signaling that's incentivized on there really fanned the flames um, and, and created this climate where rioting was sort of implicitly described as moral or at least justifiable. Um, and you have people like Governor Tony, Tony Evers of Wisconsin being too intimidated um, by the prospect of being on the wrong side of the BLM ideology to put the National Guard troops in when they needed to be in. And 35 small businesses were destroyed People's lives were ended. I mean, it's unbelievable the destruction that happened because leaders were intimidated out of doing the right thing or maybe like morally prostrate uh, to to BLM. But I, I, so that's sort of to me, I see this as the a very good case study in the double edged sword of social media and that it is the problem, but it is also in some ways the solution. Of course, that doesn't make it great that we have social media. It just means we can also use social media, I guess, to assuage some of the problems it creates. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm gonna for you're gonna have to forgive me in advance because I'm gonna go on a bit of a rant here because this, this is what really pissed me off about this entire situation. Um, and and actually, um, Anna Katchian of Red Scare I think put this really well on Twitter. Um, when she essentially and I, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said more or less, uh, the institutions and the cops and the politicians told people in a thousand ways, you're on your own. And then they are shocked and dismayed when people take them at their word. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's exactly what's going on. And that's what happened um, in that summer of 2020. Every level, um, the people who I find morally culpable for this, and when I see Kyle Rittenhouse in that trial, um, the couple times, one where he was on the stand and, and he I'm not, look, obviously I'm not like a psychiatrist or whatever, but he pretty, pretty clearly to me seems to have PTSD, right? Um, you could see his eyes lose track of where he was in the courtroom. Um, he, we, he, we know, 
according to his attorney, we know he's being treated for PTSD. He's, he okay. confirmed that this, this evening when he did a press conference after the verdict. Okay. Um, well, then I guess my armchair psych- psychiatry skills are... Anyway. Um, <laughs> well but, done. But, you know, when when it's pretty clear that this, this was an incredibly traumatic experience um, for him, he had to defend his life and he had to take two lives in order to do so. Um, he was hunted down by people who wanted to kill him. Um, and, and he has to live with the fact that he's taken these two lives. And even, even, um, even as I do think is totally justified, he was totally justified in doing that. But, um, you know, that's, that's a heavy burden for a 17 year old kid. Mm -hmm. I, and when I, I look at that, I just, I'm so furious at, not at Kyle Rittenhouse, for quote unquote crossing state lines, which is the stupidest <laughs> meme of, of all time, um, not at Kyle Rittenhouse for being there, but at the politicians and the police and the entire political environment, and of course the media, uh, for creating a situation in which ordinary citizens in this country feel that they are the last line of defense um, mm-hmm. when their towns are burning down. And of course you're going to have more violence that way. What did you think was going to happen when the institutions abdicate their role in all of this? Their job was to maintain law and order, not to prevent you know, First Amendment exercise, not to pre- prevent protests, but to prevent the total breakdown uh, of law and order that happened in cities across this country over and over and over again with no consequence. And then to turn around and be shot that you know, ordinary Americans, even the seventeen-year-old kid, um, didn't think that the right thing to do was to lock their houses, stay quietly in their bedrooms, um, and wait for for the storm to pass and burn down their homes. The fact that they went out and tried to protect each other, tried to protect property, tried to maintain some kind of law and order um, when when it had been abandoned by all those people who we pay and elect to do that very basic thing, uh, that very basic job of the state. To go ahead now and condemn him for that seems to me to be like morally reprobate. I reprobate, however you say that word. I I <laughs> I really that really like took the wind out of my rant right there at the end. Yes, Colleen. Um, no, but I, it really ticks me off. It's it's yeah. shows a total disregard um, for law abiding citizens in this country, uh, um, and and a total disregard for human nature. Like people will just continue to take this. They will continue to just watch everything burn down around them, and and the expectation is that they will stay in their homes um, and and never come out. Now, I'm not saying that the wisest thing in the world is always to like run out into a conflagration. I I don't think I would do that. <laughs> um, but but this is America, and you know yeah. we're the we're the country that pioneered the Western, right? As as like we have this all this national ethos around law and order, around uh, you know citizens really taking responsibility for law and order and then to to sort of jettison all of that and pretend that it's just wildly irresponsible for any citizen um, even somebody who who is trained for example in 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 cpr and some other medical things as kyle rittenhouse was um to go to to the the town where his whole family you know worked where he worked and and to try to do something not to shoot people but to try to do something about the fact that his town um, was was burning to the ground to, to then put all of this moral responsibility on the 17 year old kid really makes me sick. The moral responsibility here for those two deaths, for all of the billions in property damage, all of the deaths which I think are above, um, you know, above a dozen, right? It's like 18 people or something that that died uh, throughout the course of those riots in 2020 in different cities. Um, I may be wrong, but it's it's above a dozen people who died, and there were billions in property wow. damage. There were, there were about two billion dollars in property damage, right? Um, during those riots, when you add up all of these riots in the cities, uh, and to place all of that more responsibility on a 17 year old kid who did who sort of did the best he can uh, to help his community. Um, and then was put into a situation where it was life or death. It was his life or his attacker's life. Um, and it now has to live with that. Like that, that makes me really angry at, not at Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, um, in some sense, not even at the rioters. Although I, I, obviously I think they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And that's, but, but my moral anger is most reserved for the people whose job it is to maintain law and order, who are now turning around, put their job on a 17-year-old kid, and now have the goal to turn around and morally condemn him. I, that, to me, is just like a disgusting way of looking at this. 
it doesn't uh, incense me just on behalf of Rittenhouse, and I'm sure it's the same for you. I mean, men that were killed had children, and none of this had to, nobody had to be there that night. The curfew could have been enforced. This could have been taken a lot more seriously. Law enforcement could have been much more robust. None of this had to happen, but everyone was thrust into the situation. And again, I, I sort of feel very repetitive saying this, but and it sounds maybe like a virtue signal, but I think conservatives are unwise to underestimate how, like in the same way that you look at the people who who rioted in the Capitol on January 6th and say they were conditioned, they, like they have every reason not to trust any one of these authorities, um, any one of our institutions. They should not trust the news media. It is entirely rational not to trust the news media. They've placed their trust in somebody who told them they could trust nobody, and that's Donald Trump, and he plays fast and loose with that. So in the same way that you can say, like there are a lot of disenfranchised people who are clinging to hope in this case, in this case, that's also true of the rioters um, here in DC and around the country. I'm not excusing it at all, that or January 6th, but the, people have lost faith and they are right to have no faith in our institutions. And the consequence of that is when you are told from, you know, you're, as you're growing up that we live in systemic white supremacy, um, and when the president of the United States is calling voter legislation, anodyne voter legislation, uh, Jim Crow 2.0 or Jim Eagle, my God, that's powerful language. And kids are listening. Um, they are hearing this and it is really having a serious consequence. And so, yeah, if you think that the regime of Jim Crow is on the precipice of returning, you might riot. If you think that an election is being stolen, you might riot. And people are believing what used to just be sort of political hyperbole more and more and more because they rightfully trust absolutely nobody. And to your point, Inez, there's this uh, thing with Rittenhouse where even in the media now, I was watching MSNBC after the verdict uh, was rendered, and they're saying he had no, Rittenhouse had no business being there that night. He inflamed the situation by walking around with an AR. It gets to exactly what you're saying. They are blaming the person who was responding instead of the people who are causing the breakdown. It's truly unbelievable that they are now pointing the finger at Kyle Rittenhouse instead of the people that were literally torching minority-owned small businesses to the ground, uh, looting, breaking curfew, breaking all kinds of laws. The, is, does Kyle, Ritten, Kyle Rittenhouse shouldn't have been out there that night, in my opinion. Absolutely not. But like, if you are putting the weight of the blame on him instead of the people who he was only out there because they were breaking all of these laws, you're framing this in a very dangerous way. And it is one, you said there's a disregard for the public. I would say there's this, this contempt for gun owners um, and for people who look at the, the Second Amendment as something that gives them a right to self-defense, not a right to just hunt. There's just this contempt for people who think that way uh, because nobody in the, in the legacy media thinks that way um, and to protect their communities, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's a contempt. It's a contempt. It's, it's contempt, but it's also, they have no interest in trying to understand. Um, right. Yes, because it, it's it's not that unusual. I I really do think this is a a bubble thing. Like most of the reporters writing about this, or the blue check marks writing about this, they don't know anyone who regularly goes out armed. Oh yeah, it's it's um, Charles and, Murray. And yeah, they don't know. Um, like just the 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 crossing state lines discourse was just like so ridiculous, right? <laughs> um, as though it's not a totally ordinary thing in most of the country, especially alongside the state borders, to drive thirty minutes while armed. It's like a completely normal thing. My favorite my favorite one of these responses, I think it was on MSNBC, was like, "This is a license to, for civilians um, to to carry guns." Like, do you know? No. <laughs> This is not new information. They were saying um, that a lot in the coverage. They were saying this is going to embolden people who want to enact vigilante justice. Joyce Vance, as a legal analyst on MSNBC, got on the air right after and said, does this verdict make us safer? And her implication was no, it makes us uh, less safe because people are going to arm themselves to protect their communities. And it's just like, how, how are you twisting the logic here to see that as the problem? <laughs> Not everyone is that one journalist from like two or three years ago who saw earplugs on the ground and is like, I think these are rubber bullets, guys. Like, <laughs> yes. Not everybody in America is that. I, 
look, I'm I'm an effete uh, cosmopolitan elite drinking That's like true, a you are. cocktail. Like, I it's 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 not really sort of my um my scene either. Like, I've I've shot guns a few times. I've gone to the range, but it's not something I do you know for fun. Um, and and it's not kind of part of my daily life. But my God, have you ever left like a big blue city? I mean, people, pe guns are part of American life. Um, I know people from blue states on the East Coast, uh, people who I love, who shot guns for the first time and cried. It was like very traumatic for them um, in their 20s. The first time they went to like a target range and shot guns, it, it made them cry. <laughs> I, I didn't cry, but I, I would say when I, I first um, went to the range, I think I was a sophomore in college and um, like... I was afraid. I was afraid to pull the trigger, right? Even at the range, like I had this fear around it. And then of course, once you do it a few times, you lose that fear. But, um, and just, th there is this huge cultural divide over guns, but I actually want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier about the January. Cause 6th it was like riot. really smart. Probably. It was probably really smart. Um, the, about the, the, it was very smart, but about the January yeah. 6th, um, riders. And for those who don't know, Emily was actually, there as a reporter, not as a like very <laughs> Um she was there for a large part of it, um, and 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 sort of sort of observed firsthand what was going on. Um, there's I'm a survivor, right? right. Um, she wrote about it, and she also went on some podcasts to talk about it. Um, well worth your time if you want a very um, accurate and balanced way of, of of what actually happened in front of, of that capital from her vantage point. Obviously, she didn't see everything that happened, um, but. What do you think about this? Because uh, there was another sentence handed down in the last uh, 48 hours, right? And that, that was the sentence for the, the QAnon shaman who got, I think, um, 41 months or roughly. Um, so got a few years in prison um, for apparently they couldn't really prove that he was breaking in. Um, but but they did get him on, on some minor charges. They, they threw the book at him for those minor charges. And he, he ends up with about three years in prison. Um, what, what do you think about that verdict? Uh, do you think it was a just verdict? Um, and what does that case tell us about sort of whether our justice system um, is is still administering justice impartially? Yeah, and I, I'm curious for your sort of legal analysis on that question, um, because I don't have a, a law degree. Uh, but I will say, Jonathan Last of all people wrote something interesting on this where he called for a sort of beer summit 2.0 where Joe Biden should pardon the QAnon shaman and bring him uh, to the White House and sort of talk through the level of institutional distrust that led him to believe, as he now concedes falsely, that the election was stolen in uh, some of these like ludicrous, uh, ludicrous arguments. Um, and I think that's really interesting, but I think this is the wrong case to make that point about because this is somebody who's like clearly very mentally ill. He was like a roving um, protester, traveled around the West Coast, probably the entire country. I mean, he was in Washington that day doing this sort of thing. I think some of the more mundane cases, like the woman who took a private plane uh, to DC and a seemingly normal small business owner from Texas, um, pretty wealthy, that would be the more interesting beer summit uh, from my perspective where there's no sort of like mental illness or anything like that or like very extreme beliefs involved. That would actually be really interesting from my perspective because I did see just a lot of on that day you know, people, you know, very ordinary people. It was a more blue collar crowd than you would see at a tea party rally, probably. Um, but it was just like a lot of ordinary people. I talked to a woman when we were, I was walking with them down Constitution Avenue. So as we're walking from uh, President Trump's speech to the Capitol, woman from my hometown. I, I was just talking to people randomly, like you're supposed to do as a journalist. And I, I'm talking to this woman who worked in the like 6,000 person town that I grew up in. She had never even voted in a presidential election before voting for Donald Trump. She was a retail worker, very sweet, very normal. Um, and she fully believed all of the things that were being said by the kind of MAGA camp about the election. That's the beer summit. Uh, so like the QAnon shaman is like the least interesting of all of these people to me because he's clearly exceptional and clearly an outlier. What's much more interesting is what has rooted deeply into um, average Americans than it is to some of those sort of exceptional people who were always going to kind of believe fringy things anyway. Um, yeah, that's that's a fair point, I think. Um, 
I will confess that this sentence, um, by contrast to a lot of the folks that I, I talked to um, on the right, I did not think the sentence sounded on its face crazy to me. Um, it makes sense to me yeah. that given the political scale of of, um, of of rioting in front and then you know going into the Capitol building and seating yourself in this in the you know in the U.S. Senate um, or in the House, I can't remember which <laughs> which side he went into, but um, it 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 makes sense to me that they would throw the book at that case. With um, the intent, by the way, to disrupt the, the legislative procedure right. of certifying yes, the election, which is very different than... That's ultimately one of the things he got convicted of, if I'm not mistaken, but... Um, right. Yes, I, yeah. I, and I that's very that different was... than just waltzing through on a regular day. I mean, they were there to, to disrupt the legislative procedure. And like, I'm I'm generally with you. I don't know all of the facts of this case. It doesn't sound insane to me. Um, I'm not like morally offended by it, but it is sort of sad when you factor in his mental illness and the fact that he's already served like 10 months in solitary. Yeah. So actually what, what concerns me about um, some of these cases, well, th there there are two things that concern me about the, the January 6th cases. One is the length of time in detention before the trial. Um, I, I legitimately think that that's a problem, which which is a subspecies of um, the larger problem here, which is uh, if we're talking about losing faith and people who have already lost faith with the institutions, right? Um, th there really isn't, and that's why this this Rittenhouse verdict, I think, was somewhat of a white pill for so many people on the right. Um, they've lost the expectation that justice is going to be administered impartially um, across the political spectrum. When you see the mm -hmm. rioters from 2020 uh, get away largely scot-free, there have been very few um, convictions, there's been very few consequences, um, despite all of the dis devastation and destruction that we've been talking about for the last, you know, whatever, 20 minutes, um, there has been very little, there have been very few consequences for those folks, right? Um, and, and so when we look at the book being thrown at the January 6th rioters, um, even this man who's obviously like mentally, um, he, he's not, he, he's competent to stand trial. Like that's, that's, that's a higher bar, but, um, he's obviously got mental issues, right? This guy, uh, the shaman with the, the horns. <laughs> um, but it, I think, I think it's less objection in my case, it's less objection to, to the sentences that are being handed down in this case and more, um, the sinking feeling of, of knowing that those sentences would not be handed down and will not be handed down for people who did comparable things, um, who are on the other side of the political spectrum that, that cannot stand for the same reasons that, you know, uh, everybody charged with the responsibility of maintaining law and order in 2020 um, cannot expect everyone to stay home uh, while they abandon that responsibility. You, you can't expect people um, to behave as though the institutions, they still have trust in the institutions when those institutions have rightfully lost that trust. Um, I'm all in favor of like all riders going to jail. That's my position. So I haven't changed that position <laughs> with regard to the January 6th riders. I think if they can prove uh, that they they um, trespass, that they they broke in, that they um, you know were attempting to stop the um, the democratic procedure uh, that was happening, I, I think that the book should be thrown at people in that situation. I also think the book should be thrown at people who burned down the town of Kenosha, um, mm -hmm. and and. I guess I do come back to you with all of this. None of this had to happen if the people who had actual power were more responsible about how they were using it. Um, and I include Donald Trump in that analysis, frankly. Yeah. It's it's um, e even even if if he's right about uh, and it's it's not that the claims regarding the election are are some of them are just completely you know factually false, right? But um, a lot <laughs> of them are, are not. I mean, th there was that entire Time magazine piece that was basically. I mean, if it had been written by somebody on the right, people would have been like, oh, this is hysterical yeah. you know, Alex Jones stuff, where they said, yeah, we we literally got together in small rooms and we coordinated. Cabals. And the social media companies, and we we made sure that we, we got rid of um, bad stories and, and we um, changed the laws before the election. There was a concerted effort to do that, all because we knew we couldn't survive uh, Donald Trump getting another term. So in that sense... Um, I don't think those concerns are are crazy, um, but I do think that that a person who cares deeply about the future of this country, um, even even when cheated, has to think about his words and and the power that he really has um, over people. And that's that's always been one of my problems with Donald Trump. Honestly, I, I think he takes himself too seriously and the country not seriously enough. Um, and I. I 
I know that he's sort of, he, he is a patriot. I, I believe that. Um, and I think he was a good president for, for most of the time. Um, but that, that sort of personality flaw, that character flaw in him has consequences. It, it, it really has consequences. Um, and, and like, I, I don't know, I think here about the, the precedent of like an Andrew Jackson who, I mean, there, there's all kinds of historical debate about whether or not it was a corrupt bargain, but um, Andrew Jackson <laughs> lost lost a, a, a um, close election uh, the first time he ran um, because the, the election was thrown to the House of Representatives, right? Uh, there was a tie, and then the election was thrown to the House of, House of Representatives, and so there was some, some horse trading, and one of the key votes then ended up with a plum position in cabinet. I'm not going to go into all of the historical details, but it was called the corrupt <laughs> bargain at the time, right? Um, that that uh, there, there was the feeling um, both from Jackson and from his followers that he had been robbed of that presidential election. Um, he comes back four years later and he wins, right? Um, but he concedes. And, and, and Nixon concedes, right, um, in 1960, when we know, I would, I'm fairly confident um, in, in just straight up saying this without the allegedly that, you know, Joe Kennedy definitely, um, you know, rig the election for his son, right? For JFK. Yeah. Um, and and so, you know, Nixon had very good reason to to believe that uh the election had been stolen from him, but he conceded in, in 1860 because I'm sorry, in 1960, because the the peaceful transfer of power and the faith in the American election system um is something that people should take seriously. Uh obviously the left doesn't take that seriously anymore, but um, I don't think Donald Trump took that seriously. I don't think he took his responsibility um as as a voice that people would listen to seriously. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I sort no, of no, no. the people in power and all of this really bother me morally. The, the, the people who are responding to the messages given to them by people in power, I have much, much more sympathy for than I have for the people who are abdicating their responsibility as folks who are actually wielding power. One of my biggest problems with Donald Trump, and I, I, I don't, I mean, I completely understand the argument that, you know, it's dwelling on the negatives about Trump while the left is scorched, going scorched earth on our culture is not the most constructive way to spend our time. I understand that. But probably my biggest irritation is what you just touched on. And it's extremely salient right now because we're watching these sort of uh, laboratories in various states where it's Ron DeSantis or Blake Masters or J.D. Vance or Glenn Youngkin who are are learning some of the really key lessons from Donald Trump and trying to do it without what's clearly the baggage. I mean, over the Trump administration as a journalist, you talk to, and probably even um, at, like anyone, you talk to Trump supporters, the one thing they would say over and over again is like, I wish you would just stop the tweeting. That's not something they're being told to say or conditioned to say by any Anybody. It was just genuinely what a lot of Trump supporters, um, hardcore and just regular Trump supporters really thought. Um, and I, my, my biggest sort of irritation with him is that I think he really exploited the distrust, the reasonable distrust that a lot of disenfranchised people and enfranchised people in this country have in the system, um, like post-recession. This is really, really running very deep. Um, and I think it, to be a responsible steward of that trust, you, you shouldn't traffic in uh, hyperbole meant to uh, advance your cause your individual cause um, over the truth. And that's one of the big problems that I always, I, I don't really mind exaggerations in politics. I mean, it's hilarious to hear the hysterics from the left every time Trump basically partook in, in normal, banal political hyperbole. But when you're telling people that the election was stolen, then of course they're going to go to the Capitol and riot. I mean, of course, that's this is what people are going to do. There, there's just, of course. Um, and so that's still one of, I think, the biggest, I mean, I blame the people who rioted for the rioting. Um, I think Donald Trump could have probably done more to tamp down on it. But yeah, I mean, I, I blame basically the left for creating this entire climate, not the left, the uniparty of uh, the, the centrist uniparty in control, the establishment, the uniparty establishment for all of this. That said, the reason that's an interesting conversation is because um, we're watching Ron DeSantis and Blake Masters do, I think, a lot of what Trump did talk to the press and to the political establishment the way that Donald Trump did very successfully. We saw a little bit of this with Glenn Youngkin, um, very successfully take on the culture war, very successfully take on the political establishment. 
And that's the future of the right. Um, and, and that's a huge thing to work out. I mean, just a few years ago, I would have said, you know, there is no Trumpism without Donald Trump. He is singular and he is essential to Trumpism. Um, at the same time, that said, it, it, there can be sort of aspects of Trumpism that go on without Trump that can be successful for the right and for conservatives. I think Chris Rufo is doing, like there's been so much navel gazing post NatCon and that's one of the things that drives me crazy is these like dueling op-eds and everybody who was there wants to write about what they saw. And I really think that's an affliction of the right because there are these conservative media outlets that have low, low barriers to entry compared with uh, the institutional media or the legacy media. And so everybody wants to opine because everybody thinks they have a uniquely interesting insight. And meanwhile, like Rufo is out there doing stuff. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it is like- you and, I, you and I have uniquely interesting insights. So I, well, I don't but know But that's a given, about. that's a given, that's a given. Um, yeah, so, but anyway, that's why I think, and, and Trump, for all of his blathering on Twitter, like he didn't dilly dally in the way that is sort of normal for Washington. Um, he would do things, uh, you know, he, he loved to like actually just do stuff. And I think that the sort of lessons are actually like Blake Masters, as we were recording this, just put out a statement on the Rittenhouse verdict. That is something that Republicans five years ago, they would not be aggressively putting out statements. They'd be avoiding the press for the entire weekend while they're in their home district so as not to get questions about it because they don't want to have to answer and talk about the fact that they thought the Rittenhouse verdict was good, despite the fact that they're all their entire base thought that. Um, so there, there are like real changes happening, but I think you raise a point that's like, don't play fast and loose with the truth in the same way that uh, as we're sort of moving ahead that Donald Trump did because it's exploitive and it's not a sort of moral or responsible way to approach the people who are turning to you for, uh, you know, m the right things, the right facts. Um, you know, having critiqued the right and Donald Trump, uh, I think we should move on to critiquing the center. Uh, <laughs> oh, please. Uh, so you brought up the young victory a few times. Um, and I, I want to tie together a few elements that may seem um, at first to, to be sort of disparate and not have nothing to do with each other. One, <laughs> one is the Rittenhouse verdict. One is the victory for Glenn Youngkin in delivered primarily by moderate and even um, sort of center left uh, folks who voted for Joe Biden in, in 2020, right? Um, who, who voted in a Republican primarily on cultural issues, primarily on education, right? Um, on, on these debates about critical race theory. And I know there's some dispute about whether or not we should actually interpret the race that way. And everybody has their own little Rorschach test for how that race should go. I'm pretty certain that that, that was the core of that race. Um, but, you know, look, I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times before, but I, I think that was the core of that race. And I think um, the fact that that was a successful bid in a plus 10 democratic state um, is something very notable about the future of the Republican party. Um, and then, and finally, uh, stuff that's been going on at Yale Law School, which at first glance, you know, who cares what goes on at, at Yale Law School yeah. <laughs> They're on the world um, after they graduate. Uh, but but it, it does tend to be insular. And there's a lot of like sort of personalities in, in, in things that seem almost gossipy about the series of stories that have been happening at Yale Law School, where administrators, um, totally unrelated stories where administrators have told students that they're they're to me, the common thread here is administrators telling students, like representatives of the university, telling students that their careers as lawyers would be in jeopardy because um, they wouldn't do something the administration wanted for political reasons. In one case, it was denounced Professor Amy Chua um, for something that they, these students who are now suing say was not true, that the university wanted them to say, to attest to things that were not true um, and threaten their careers over it. Um, and uh, the then there was there was um, a kid who sent out an email, including the horrible word, word trap house, right? Um, yes, a yes. Party, uh, which would be kind of a typical like woke story on a college campus, right? The kind of thing that is really important, but I feel like at this point everybody knows about, right? Um, 
that there are these woke mobs at, on college campuses and, and they get offended over something utterly ridiculous. Um, but the, the twist in this story was that the administration, you know, called in uh, this kid and basically threatened his career said, oh, we're, we're going to have to send this, you know, the, the bard as a, um, a fitness, a character and fitness section of the bar. Um, you wouldn't want anything to happen. You need to sign this prefabricated apology statement, right? This is, this is kind of like Soviet tactics, right? Um, again, the, the notable thing to me about that was how it's advanced into the administration, but that's in some sense predictable. Um, but the thing that I see in common with all three of those stories, and, and actually I should add something to the Yale story, at the end of this saga so far, the dean who had um, acted really atrociously up till this point actually wrote out an email saying, reaffirming Yale Law School's commitment to free speech, reaffirming the Federalist Society's right to exist on campus, um, although she stopped short of actually apologizing to the student Trent. Um, but, and, and, and it, it was, you know, sort of, uh, too little too late for a lot of people. And, and I totally understand that perspective and kind of agree with it. I think it is too little too late for the Steen. But yes. the reason that I, um, bring that up is that you, you had this sort of buckling, um, of an administration in Yale Law School that, uh, was going along with the very worst of sort of the illiberal woke left and then had to backpedal, Right because they came under so much pressure that they had to back up at all. So you have these three separate incidents. You have the, the regrettably at this point, surprising verdict to some people um, of a very clear just verdict in the Rittenhouse trial of an institution functioning as though it, as, as, as it should um, in the court system. You have a victory to Glenn Youngkin, who's a moderate Republican, um, but on the basis of cultural issues delivered by people mostly center and center left, like the, the people who flipped that election. Um, and then you have the, the heart of the institutional beast, um, the dean of Yale Law School, having to backtrack on her um, sort of woke pronouncements of the past and, and the university's behavior, um, even though that, that behavior is totally atrocious, I would say that hits similar to, similarly to me because I expect the atrocious behavior and I, I'm not sure that I would expect her to backtrack. So if, if you string those three things together, I think what you see is that the, oh, and I, I guess the fourth thing, um, John McWhorter becoming a, a columnist, right, at, at the New York Times, which I actually think mm -hmm. is quite significant. Um, and so, and, and a relatively uncensored columnist, right, at, at the New York Times in the sense that his pieces at the New York Times have sounded very much in tone um, like his pieces prior to the New York Times, at least to, to my read. Right. Um, you, I think you are, there's a case to be constructed now um, that there is a center and even center left backlash that goes beyond the John McWhorter and, and Andrew Sullivan crowd, right? That that they weren't just representatives of a particular liberal left ideology, but that there there is a broader number of people, whether they are um, you know in academia or whether they're suburban moms who generally vote Democrat uh, in Northern Virginia, um, there is there is a backlash to the illiberality um, and the extreme extremism of the woke left. Um, and I think that the danger of that is becoming very clear even to people in the center and the center left. My question for you is what are your hopes for that backlash, one? And two, I guess my opinion is kind of built into the second thing. Um, because they are on the center and because they're coming to this place um, of seeing this danger from the left for the first time when folks on the right have seen it, uh, for, for a much longer period of time, at least a decade. Um, I guess I kind of doubt they're going to be in favor of what's necessary in terms of, of um, really gutting institutions that have gone, I guess essentially, I'll rephrase it, has the rot in the institutions gone so far that any solution from the liberal left, even if there is a kind of uprising, um, is it too late for that uprising? What kind of solutions are they likely to put forward? Are those solutions going to be enough to actually push some of this ideology out of the institutions? Are they salvageable? Or is the right, you know, sort of correct that um, these institutions are mostly completely unsalvageable? We need to start from scratch. Well, I think it's both. Um, and that's just my quick perspective is that I think the institutions are 
unsalvageable. But if you start your own institutions and compete with them, um, that's where they start sort of have to strip down and start from the ground up. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen. But the way that I see it um, in response to your question is that it feels like a race against the clock. I think it's I think it's a center left and a center, um, a revolt of the center and of the center left. John McWhorter is a great example. He was on Federal Australia Hour this week, center left, Barry Weiss, center left, even on key cultural issues. Um, and that's not to say Republicans are suddenly going to change their tune on gay marriage. That's obviously not going to happen. But the center left and the center are sort of aligned in this. I mean, even for some people, like, I don't even know why we're calling John McCorder center left. He's only center left because he's anti-woke, um, because the left has lurched so dramatically in such short time in one direction. Um, and and that, that's just sort of like how that happens. And uh, I think you're right to, to discern a revolt. Um, but the question from my perspective is, can the left, um, sort of to the point earlier about Gen Z, like, can can this actually happen in time um, or have the minds of enough people been polluted fundamentally against this country? Um, because, and, and as you and I have talked about this, we've had really interesting conversations about this. Um, I remember one, it was like super humid night this summer, we were talking about this. The... Uh, it, it, if, if you cannot fundamentally agree that the country is redeemable and the left does not, that's the entire premise of the 1619 project, essentially, that there's, there's nothing fundamentally redeemable about the United States of America. So if you can't agree with that, um, then what is there to save in this project? I mean, psychologically, intellectually, uh, logically, there's really just no reason to, to hold fast to any of our traditions or our founding. So if enough people's minds have already been polluted and if they get into the workforce and into the voting booths um, in high enough numbers, I don't know that this is salvageable and that we don't just sort of end up like a giant version of Norway. Um, we've seen backlash in some Scandinavian countries and some European countries. I mean, people love to use the Hungary example. Uh, you can point to other examples in different countries, too, of sort of cultural backlash. Um, we've seen that happen, even in countries that sort of codify their, their leftism. So it's not, I mean, I don't, I don't know, like, it's not that all hope is lost, but I do think that this is a race. And that's the way sort of fundamentally I see it, is that it's a race for sort of sanity. Um, and if you're in the thrall of this religion, as McWhorter describes it, and I don't always love that comparison, but I think the way he lays it out is very fair because he's not saying it is literally a faith. He's saying that it has the psychological effect of religion in all of these salient ways. So if you're in the thralls of that kind of religion, you, you won't be reasoned with. So it's a race to see how many people we can save before they become true believers of the, the church of wokeness. I think you're right to say it's a race. Um, I don't know that the Norway option is an option for the United States because of other cultural and um, just just facts about this country, right? Um, yeah, you're not taking guns I, without. I, yeah, yeah I, I, I tend to think you know the United States is, and and bear in mind that I think most of this is is really a positive thing about the United States. The United States is young and vigorous and robust. Like our national character is. Still, um, we are still a young country. We are incredibly mm -hmm. diverse, um, especially compared to like Norway, Sweden, even with their immigration, recent immigration, there's no comparison um, in terms of homogeneity in, in the system. Um, we have a very individualistic culture. Material uh, and cultural wealth. We are yeah, miles ahead of every other country. Um, yeah. There is no cultural, and we're seeing this with the inflation, right? Um, and, and with shortages and stuff. Like there is no American... Um, sort of precedent in the American mind, even though Americans have suffered greatly uh, from want over the centuries. I'm thinking about the Great Depression, or um, but even during the Great Depression, America was suffering less than the rest of the country, the rest of the world. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Americans have always been relatively prosperous from colonial days. Relatively prosperous. Um, Americans are not. Like, I don't think America is going to do socialism like Sweden or like tyranny like the USSR. I, I actually think it's going to be worse because. There, yeah. there isn't any um, anything that holds all of these wildly disparate peoples 
together. Um, yeah. So I don't think slow decline. I kind of disagree with Ross Douthat in this sense. I don't. I don't. I don't think that slow decline is really in the cards for America. Um, I think things will change much, much faster because of who we are as a people. Um, and and I think all of those characteristics about us as a people are really great. But I think in this case, it's going to be spectacular, right? If we don't fall, if we don't pull out of the dive, it, 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 it's going to crash in a spectacular way. It's not going to to sort of slowly decline in the way that old Europe did. I don't think that's kind of in the the American cards. And you see, you see this in how like completely incompetent, right? American institutions are in comparison <laughs> to European, even even the socialist institutions of, of like some European countries are are less incompetent than the DMV here, right? It, 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 it just... <laughs> We don't do government well. Yeah. Um, well, it's because we there's a huge chunk of us that doesn't want to do government well. Right. Yeah. I, well, the best people in America are entrepreneurs. They go into, they make millions of dollars. They, you know, um, they, they do all these other things. Um, actually, I think the show The Americans really portrays this well, even though initially it really ticked me off when I was watching it. Um, I was like, why do they portray all of the people... Uh, who are on the American side as like these dullards who are completely one uninteresting, like they're bad at their jobs. They're and, and then all of the people on the Soviet side are like they're fascinating. They have all these like sort of complex, um, you know, interests and and they're really good at their jobs. Well, there's something true to that because the, the elite of Soviet society went into their KGB, right? Like they're selecting the way to get ahead in that kind of society is all the best and brightest want to go into. The KGB or want to go into, um, you know, the party or want to go into if you don't have any any moral principles anyway. Um, but America isn't like that. And so our, our like government services, nobody in America, like we don't teach kids to even though we have this larger and liar, larger compliance bureaucratic sector, yeah. I don't think kids lay, lay awake at night being like, mommy, I want to be a bureaucrat. Like I want to be a high ranking bureaucrat in Washington. I don't think that's part of American, the American soul and character. I think that's good. Uh, but it, I do think it'll mean we'll, we'll, we'll do decline a lot worse. We, we can't do like, you know, manage decline. I don't think that's in the, in the cards for us. Um, but it, returning to the, this, the sort of rebellion for a minute, I, what I, what I really worry about, um, is, is with regard to, to these folks in, in the center. Um, and we, we can segue this into what we should do, um, if mm -hmm. we get another bite at this, this power apple, because all of the polls, all of the, and I'm scared something is going to happen between now and 2022 now, but, um, you know, they look good for, for the Republican party. Um, they, they also look good, uh, for the center left folks in the sense that, um, you know, we're focusing on the most dangerous aspects of the left. Um, and so I, I think when Trump is a little bit out of the picture and, and now that we've had this disastrous time under Joe Biden, um, I do think that, you know, there will be a sort of coalition that develops, whether it can hold together, I don't know, but I, you know, I think young can shows that you can put together these different elements of the coalition. And you and I have, have um, chatted about this in the past, so whether it's possible to put together like a, a um, working class, from Ohio suburbs of Virginia coalition, right? Um, there's a lot of reasons why that wouldn't work. Uh, but it seems for now out of um, expedience, that is kind of coming together. That coalition is kind of coming together. Um, why, what I worry about is that because of the race you were referring to, right? I, I kind of think we get one, one shot at this. Mm. And that the next people, whatever, if they're center left, whether they're... Um, whether they're right wing, um, the next people who are anti woke who take substantial power, political power, it seems to me that they have to make institutional and transformative change that stops that clock in a way, right? Um, we have to radically change the education system in this country. We have to radically rein in bureaucratic power in this country. Um, yeah. These are not like, you know, tax cut bills, or these are not even like, um, you know, even something like health care, which neither party has really been able to move uh, since Obamacare, right? Um, and Obamacare itself was was a massive compromise for the left. Um, yeah. So it, it, the, even something that I would call like a sort of intermediate transformative issue like healthcare in the sense that it's not dealing with the fundamental structure of the country, but it is a huge part, like a, it's restructuring whatever, six of the economy. So it's like sort of a, a mid-tier uh, project for, for a political party. 
Um, whereas the, the kind of gimmies or the low hanging fruit will be, you know, more spending for the Republican Party, it's tax cuts, it's, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, it seems to me that the solutions have to be radical and transformative enough to stop that clock. And then I still think we're not out of the woods because, you know, you as you point out, we already have a generation and a half of people who have really been poisoned by this, this separation between themselves and their country and fundamentally see their country as irredeemable. And the Republic is still going to have to, you know, live with the fact that that bulk and the millennials are the largest generation, right? So that bulk of voters is going to move through the power structure, not only as voters, but through all of, you know, they're going to move up in, in corporations and they're going to, you know, head up and they're going to, you're going to be a bunch of presidents who are millennial, right? So um, we're still going to have to deal with that. It's still going to be a very bumpy ride. Um, but it seems to me that if we get a shot at changing this, those solutions have to be transformative. What, what is done by the next administration in power that is anti-woke, um, wh whichever part of that political spectrum it comes from. And I worry if it comes from the sort of center left or even if the center left um, has a large seat in it, um, that they will shy away from the kind of massive transformations that have to be done, right? Like you'll get your Ann Applebaum type columns. <laughs> saying, oh no, we can't fire bureaucrats. That's fascism. Your Polish right? sister. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And, and I, I worry that, I worry that we'll, we'll like miss this opportunity because I really, I agree with you wholeheartedly that it, it is a race. You have to, to bear in mind that, Time is on the side of the wokes here. I think average people have more power in our culture than they do in our government. And um, so to the extent you're, you are completely right that if there's, Glenn Youngkin's actually a really good example. Uh, Glenn Youngkin is already not doing the DeSantis thing where he overrides uh, county um, mask mandates. Um, he, it, like It's another like, is Glenn Youngkin the man who like signed favorable BLM stuff while he was at the head of the Carlisle group and favorable LGBTQ stuff when he was at the head of the Carlisle group? Is he the vehicle for this? Is he because he's kind of moderate on those issues, the perfect vehicle or is he the, the antithesis of the perfect vehicle? These are good questions. We don't have answers to them yet. We have reasons to be extremely skeptical, but I think that's, you're completely right that center right, center left people don't have the stomach for uh, radical transformation, but that's because they're still sort of responsive to a very unhealthy culture and um, legislation. So like it, it's common sense that narrow legislation that bans literal racism um, from our education curricula, like that's something that Republican governors should pass. Do I understand the Camille Foster argument? Absolutely. Do I think still, though, that there's a way to have like a narrow ban on actual racist curricula? Absolutely. And and most of the, the woke curricula would fall under racism. I mean, it, it, it absolutely would. Just if you swapped it out, I was talking to John McWhorter about this this week, if you swapped it out with texts that were in favor of Jim Crow and you took away the context, people wouldn't know. They would be like, wow, this is really racist. Um, so yeah, there, there's certain things like that that can be done. But when I think about these issues, what scares me more than anything is just all of the trends that have created immense alienation um, and that have you know left us sort of on Facebook um, for our psychological comforts and our human relations. And on Instagram, we have a generation of people that has a stunning level of diagnosable mental illnesses. Um, and I think we don't fully understand social media's impact on that yet. But when you look at what happened immediately after the iPhone was introduced, which is when I was in high school, it is immediate. I mean, the, the effect seems to be immediate. We need more research on this. But that's what scares me even more than the sort of lack of legislative muster to handle these things, because I think our culture is going more deeply in a very, into a very dangerous place. And when you talk about the, the slow death of old Europe, it's interesting because like America is an enlightenment project, but it's not a secular enlightenment project and it never has been. Um, and I don't think we've ever seen this level of like secular modernity. Of course we haven't. That's the, the sort of point of modernity. But th this is not something that like and Brett Weinstein and Heather Hang's new book is really good on this. We are, technology is, has hit a clip where it's evolving way faster than the, than human nature can keep up with, that the human brain and the human body can keep up with. We're in a very anti-human time. And um, that sort of gives me hope in the sense that 
the the sort of human nature can win out at the ballot box and and by human nature I, I literally mean things like Glenn Youngkin getting elected because you shouldn't put young men you shouldn't enable young men to use the same restrooms as young women when they're hormonal teenagers is obviously unsafe um, that those sorts of things like Jordan Peterson's book being a runaway bestseller there are sorts of things that you know will human nature win out sure but that still probably gets to the race part um, you know can the elites dominate this from top down. Um, and I don't actually think legislation is the most powerful avenue um, or the courts are the most powerful avenue here. Um, Baranoff Stutzman just settled this week after years of being, this is the most anti-American tragedy that I can think of legally. The, this, this woman who is a, just a sweet Christian florist um, ended up having to pay $5,000 to these people who just keep suing her because she wouldn't serve a gay wedding. Um, would it wouldn't partake in, I think it was art, and, and as you would know this better than I do, that uh, celebrates a gay wedding. I mean, that's a, that's your canary in the coal mine, and that's been happening for years. Um, so this is, to me, it's, it's just, there's, there's so few things that we can do um, legislatively that have the same power of things that we could do culturally. I, I think, I'm not sure I agree with that. I have to think about it more because that's good. I, I, I do think I do think that legislation does the, uh, to this extent. I agree with like Sorab, uh, Hamari, and some of these like legislation and culture are locked in a a loop, right? A hundred percent. Yes, I agree totally. We change the culture with the Civil Rights Act, right? Yes, a hundred percent. The enforcement of the law it changed the culture. It's our um, norms. It affects our norms. A hundred percent. You see this with marijuana. Yeah, I agree. Terry Schilling always says, like, absolutely, politics is downstream of culture, but culture is also downstream of politics. It's totally true. Uh, and as an aside, every time that is used wrong by that team, I get so frustrated because, you know, uh, Andrew Breitbart could not be accused by literally anyone of not caring about the culture war. And actually, I, I think that people are using his quote to mean something that he absolutely did not mean by it. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is... He was he was trying to tell the Republican Party and the conservative movement that they needed to pay attention to culture. He wasn't yes. specifying whether that would be legislation or like, but but I think he understood we were beyond the point of dinner dinner conversations, which is which was Reagan's solution, right? Reagan's solution um, in his farewell address, um, he points out everything that is happening to us now. He was very prophetic about it, uh, but his solution at the end is I don't know what to do about this other than. You know, we need to, to we need to have these conversations around our dinner table, and we need to change the culture. Um, I think Breitbart was very, you know, obviously um, not knocking Reagan here. You know, he was leaving office in 1988 and, and 1989. Um, yeah, yeah, he had the benefit Breitbart of Breitbart said this in 2012, right? So yeah. uh, totally different context. But I think he was he was doing the same wake up call. He was saying, expend your political capital on culture because if you don't, you're going to lose everything. Um, and, and I think in that way, he was he was also very prophetic. And um, I, I just I don't like people. I agree with their larger point, but I don't like people taking that quote, uh, I think, out of context and and to say that we shouldn't legislate on cultural issues, because that's kind of what they're saying. We shouldn't use apply political solutions to cultural problems. I don't think that's what Andrew Breitbart was saying at all. But in any case, um, I want to close this out with um, and every time I think we're going to do this on these after dark episodes, but um one thing, Emily, what's one thing that you have read or listened to in the last month that you think probably did not get the analysis or the coverage that it deserved and maybe the listeners have not seen um, on their feeds yet? Yeah, this is a really easy answer for me. It would be David Sirota's um, new podcast on Audible called Meltdown. It's uh, about the Great Recession, but actually about the fallout from the Great Recession and our uh, government's extremely lackluster response to it. He, he goes into the mechanics of why that happened and how that happened, how that lackluster response was mounted um, and why, with some really good insight from people who were on the inside. Um, and to understand, uh, and I, I was sort of fairly young, uh, I guess I was in high school um, and early college as this was all playing out, but um, it does really, I think, dimensionalize uh, the, the current moment when you understand how profound uh, the left and the right's uh, response to the Great Recession, how profoundly, uh, how profoundly consequential that was, and the the level of institutional distrust when you are reminded of the degree of loss that people suffered um, in, in sort of very specific personal accounts. 
it's a it's a really it adds a lot of perspective i think to the current moment and it's super compelling um Sirota's a good reporter so i highly recommend that yeah that sounds really fascinating i'm gonna have to check that out because um i think it's something that people miss about the tea party all the time right mm -hmm. um the, the a huge part of the response of the tea party was not just to like debt and spending but was to the inherent unfairness of elites getting a bailout yep while everybody else did not and um i think that was a huge part of what launched the tea party this this feeling that the game is rigged. Um, There's a and whole episode on the Santelli rant um, on Dave, in David Sirota's podcast, and it's very critical of it because the Santelli rant itself was kind of anti like bailout for bailout. in a different way. Yeah, but it was like anti bailout in a in a sort of like in a different way. But it's very very interesting to get fresh perspective on it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think um, a lot of the response to the Santelli rant was basically uh, yeah they should not get a bailout. We, sh you know, th these are people who, who made responsible choices and responded to that. Um, yes. Santelli bailout, like they said, yeah, we don't agree with this bailout, but um, also they, they didn't want to bail out their neighbors, but they really didn't want to bail out the banks, right? Yeah. There was huge sentiment in the Tea Party. Um, basically, you know, you, you made your bed and you lie with it. Like, um, yeah. and, and anyway, uh, I think, I think that's a really great recommendation. My recommendation is going to be uh, this Manhattan Institute event that I attended in person, but you can watch uh, on, on, on the YouTubes um, or on their site, Manhattan Institute. Um, and it, it is, the event is called Black Patriotism, the case for Black Patriotism. Um, it is a talk from um, Glenn Lowry, and he gave a very similar talk at NatCon. So the talk is not new. He's also uh, written up that case it, very, very persuasively. I mean, literally kind of brought a tear to my eye when I was listening to it. Uh, but what I want to point you to, that case absolutely worth um, seeing, but I, I don't think it qualifies as undercovered because I saw it a lot of places and probably chances are a lot of you have had the pleasure of either listening to or reading uh, that case from Glenn Lowry, which I think is well worth your time if you haven't. But the undercovered thing um, at this event was a response from um, a guy named John Wood, uh, who works with uh, an organization called Better Angels. Um, but it was, I think the best sort of check for myself um, mm. that I've heard in terms of my instincts about, um, not about like BLM as an organization, for example, um, and he, he's definitely sort of center or right of center, um, but about the relationship, um, the, the complicated relationship that a lot of people in Black America have with the country. Um, mm. And I, I, I think the way that he presented that rebuttal, and I'm, I'm going to put rebuttal in quotes because it wasn't really a rebuttal. I mean, I think on a lot of things he agree, agrees with the Glenn Lowry perspective, but I, I think it was more of a defense for sensitivity and, um, you know, a, a, a little bit of, of human understanding about how sometimes even justified rage can be unproductive. Mm -hmm. um, and it really did remind me of actually um, parts of his rebuttal, especially, for example, um, addressing like a type of honor culture. He doesn't use this words, uh, those words at all, but a type of honor culture uh, among some um, sort of cultural strata of black Americans um, that does lead to, for example, a lot of violence. I mean, that's something that they shared with the Irish when um, the Irish came uh, with, with certain grievances, mostly against England, but, but then replicated in the United States. Um, and obviously those experiences are different in a lot of ways, but it reminded me even of, of uh, Sort of my own experience uh, culturally, there, there is such a thing as, as sort of passed down distrust and passed down uh, generational stories. And, and it is important for us, I think, to remember that uh, those stories of genuine oppression, no matter how much they are uh, twisted by certain parts of, of the, the left and the woke left and um, in an unproductive ways, that, that those stories do, do hold a lot of pain. Um, and, and that that pain doesn't necessarily go away in like a generation or two, right? Um, it does it does continue through families and it, it results in attitudes, uh, learned attitudes, um, both in relation to the world and also in relation specifically to patriotism or government or how you feel about your country. Um, and I, I just thought it was it was really well worth listening to. It was a very serious case um, for understanding and, and a little bit of sensitivity. Um, and I, I just, it, it struck me, that it must be particularly painful to have that kind of history uh, in the country that to everyone else, like for folks like my parents and, um, you know, and, and virtually everybody, um, everybody else who came to America voluntarily uh, has been the promised land. It has been the land, land of opportunity. Um, and it has that been that way for Black Americans as well. But um, 
I, I can understand that 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 relationship is is much more complicated than it is for for anybody else. Um, and it must have been particularly painful for that relationship to be one of oppression um, in the country that was sort of the land of freedom and opportunity for for everyone else around the world and the beacon of hope for everyone else around the world. So highly recommend that rebuttal. I think that it's worth your time kind of check some of your own premises um, if you are in agreement with folks like like me and Emily. Um, and just to remind you all, we will be doing these After Dark episodes once a month. We'll be doing them. They'll be the last Wednesday of, of each month. Um, so so come check out our After Dark episodes. It's always we're always happy to hear from you. Um, and thank you. Thank you for listening. So thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Setman, as well as After Dark, is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button, leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or iwf.org, wherever else you get your podcasts. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.